Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. Good morning, church. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We, uh, I think we can all agree that uh, we live in a crazy world, right? Like, yeah, in a crazy time. Um, I was talking to my son the other day. Um, both are our youngest uh, are in high school. And I was asking about his grades, you know. I, was, I wanted to make sure he's keeping up with his grades. And I said, how are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm doing great. You know, I have these great grades, you know. And I was like, well, well you know, how, how's that, how are you doing that? You know what I mean? Like, you studying hard, whatever. He's like, no. He's like, actually, um, AI. He's like, I, I get out my page of math homework, and I just take a photo of it. And, then, and it just does it all. And I can just submit it. Like, so, like, the first thought in my head is, why are you telling me this? <laughs> the second thing was, is, why did they have that in high school when I was in high school, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you guys messed around with this AI thing? It's weird, right? It's, it, it'll paint pictures for you, and it'll write stories for you. I've been getting emails um, that uh, offer... Uh, me uh, as a pastor, if I, if I sign up for this subscription, um, that uh, AI will write all my sermons. Yeah. What do you guys think so far? Is it working? Or <laughs> I'm telling you, if uh, AI writes, writes your sermon, like, uh, I, man, you got you to gotta find another job. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's one thing to have a, a machine, you know, wash your laundry, you know. Um, it's another thing for, for us to rely on machines to think and, uh, and then also ultimately rely on machines to receive the gospel. Uh, I'm not liking where this is going, you know. And I try to tell my kids, I said, you know, AI, just because AI tells you something doesn't mean that it's right. Because, like, literally you know, what it does is it just combs all this information and then just regurgitates the most common responses back. I mean, it sounds good, right? But oftentimes it's not true. It's just, it's just echoing what, what it finds, you know, on all these websites, you know. Um, and it, that means it's not necessarily a trustworthy thing at all, you know. I decided, uh, I decided this week I was going to ask AI, um, what's wrong with the world today? Um, I wanted it to, it to say me, but it didn't. It didn't do that. Um, this is what it gave me. Some major issues facing the world today include climate change, widespread conflict and war, extreme poverty, growing inequality, food insecurity, political instability, mass migration, resource depletion, biodiversity loss, all of which contribute to significant human suffering, environmental degradation across the globe. Sounds nice. As you scroll down the page, what you'll find is all this stuff repeated on all these websites. You know, you can see it just kind of combed through these websites and then just plopped it out for you. Um, my question uh, for AI is, what's the common denominator in all of these things? Do you guys get what I'm saying? Where does all this stuff come from? Conflict, war, poverty, inequality, food insecurity, climate change. What AI is giving us is the symptoms. It's not giving us the cause. It's giving us the externals, the consequences, the repercussions. Climate change, conflict, war, poverty. That's all the result. What's the cause? It's in here. It's in here. You follow what I'm trying to say here? Yeah. AI isn't going deep enough. It isn't going deep enough. 
you know, if you ask people at church, you know, what they would say is, you know, well, what's, what's really at the root of all of our problems? What's wrong with the world today? Probably the most common response you'll hear is from, from a Christian would be sin. Um, I'm not sure that goes deep enough either. Sin is a problem. Most definitely. But if you actually follow Jesus in the Gospels, you know, Jesus isn't really thrown off by sinners. He isn't really thrown off by sin. And in fact, oftentimes it's the sinners, it's the ones whose lives are burdened and muddied by sin that are the ones running to him for healing. Do you follow me here? It's not keeping them from the Lord. They're actually running to him. Do you know that sin can actually be the thing in your life that leads you to the Lord? You know what really throws Jesus off? You know the thing where it says, you know, in scripture where it says, you know, Jesus is, he marvels. (laughs) That's the, what? (laughs) You know? It's not sin. It's hardness of heart. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus marvels at their hardness of heart. It says that Jesus is actually angered by their hardness of heart. Now sin leads to a hardened heart. You follow me there? That's what sin can do to us. It, it, It slowly cools and makes cold and hard and rigid our heart. But a hardened heart, you follow me here? More than even what we do is what keeps us from healing. Is what keeps us from true life. You know, this is what was wrong with the Pharisees. I mean, the Pharisees pretty, had it pretty much together, right? Sin, generally speaking, mostly under control. In fact, they were so diligent about it, far more diligent than you and I. But their hearts were hardened. You follow me here? You know, in this series, we're, we're, taking, we're taking this journey. We're going old school as a church. We're taking a journey of Advent. And the word, the journey of Advent is a journey of preparation. We're trying to prepare ourselves to receive Jesus. Do you know that even if you're a Christian, you need to receive Jesus? You need Jesus in your life. Uh, Yeah, I'm not talking, I mean, I mean, even if you're, you know, you say, I was baptized, I gave my life to the Lord, you know, you still need Jesus. And the reason why is because being a Christian doesn't protect your heart from becoming hard, does it? We can all get a hard heart. Even the most, even the most gung-ho Christian, you know, gung-ho disciple's heart can harden. What's wrong with the world today is a hardened heart, and you and I are not immune from it. And so we have to prepare our hearts to receive the Lord, and we have to keep preparing our heart to receive the Lord. Over and over and over again. If we're not working on keeping our heart ready and prepared to receive him, our heart will grow cold. You want to know what a hardened heart looks like? You know, there was this video that came out. I don't know how long ago it was. Maybe about a year or so. It's this security footage. It was in a city and there's this homeless man. And you see him walking along. He looked homeless anyways. Walking along the a sidewalk and some people come up and it's caught on the camera. They, they beat him up and they take his stuff and he's laying there in the sidewalk and it's cold. And you could just see it, you know, uh, people start to, you know, stroll by and they just walk on by and they just kind of look at him and then they just keep going, you know, person after person after person walk on by unmoved unaffected got better things to do that's a hard heart I wonder how many of those folks that walked on by were believers in the Lord Jesus just had better things to do calling yourself a Christian it is no way protect you from a hardened heart and I have to say it I We have to ask ourselves, I mean, does Jesus marvel at us? 
and we come to church and we sing songs. Marvels that our heart is still so hard, so cold, so unmoved. It's hard work to prepare our heart to receive him. It takes God work. And so this is the scripture that we get today. We get this last verse in the last chapter of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3. It's the very last chapter of the Old Testament. And the prophet Malachi says this, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will, what? Prepare the way before me. The way needs to be prepared. Do you see that? The way has to be prepared. Work has to be done beforehand. If we're going to walk the way, if we're going to receive the way, if we're going to receive Jesus who is the way, something has, preparation has to be made. Prepare the way. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, declares Malachi. Who's the temple? Well, we know that you and I are the temple of God. The Lord God wants to come to us as his in temple, make us his home to live as Jesus says to dwell within us. I will abide in you. I will make my home within you. I will live within you. You will be my temple. You will be my glory. You will be my home. But for that to happen, the work has to be done. Preparation has to be made. Therefore, behold, the messenger must come to prepare the way of the Lord. And we learn who this messenger is. I mean, the last chapter in the Old Testament, the last chapter declares that the messenger must come. And then we open the New Testament and we open to the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And what we find is this same passage. Behold, the messenger has come. We're talking about John the Baptist. Behold, the messenger has come. The Gospel of Mark begins this way. Chapter 1. Verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, both Isaiah and Malachi say very similar things. And Mark does a mashup here, just like we do our mashups with our songs. He does mashups of prophecies. He puts these two things together and says, this is what we got. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. A voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. So the gospel begins not with Jesus' appearance, but with the messenger preparing the way. Because preparation has to be made. I want us to see something peculiar in this passage, something strange. You know, if you've got to slow down, whenever you read scripture, you've got to slow down. And you've got to look carefully. And you got to come to it humbly. And when you do, it begins to open up amazing things for you. And that's what we find here in the words of the prophet Isaiah. Behold, I send my messenger before your face. What does that mean? I send my messenger before your face. Whose face? Who's sending the messenger? And, is it, and, and whose face is the me- messenger going before? Do you see my question? It doesn't say, does it? Well, let's continue on and we get the answer. Again, read slowly and carefully and this is what we find. He will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Whose way is he preparing? The way of the Lord. The way of the Lord. You know what we're getting here? I don't know if you get this. Mark is actually pulling the veil back and getting us a glimpse of a divine conversation, an eternal conversation happening within the Godhead, believe it or not. You see, I will send my messenger before your face. We learn your face is the face of Jesus. That's the face of the Lord. Do you follow me here? And what we have is God the Father saying to God the Son, behold, look, I am sending my messenger before you, Jesus. He will prepare your way, Jesus. 
He will make the path straight for you, Jesus. This is a strange, this is a strange way of understanding Christmas time. You know, you and I, we think about Jesus coming from our perspective, perspective of the world, human perspective. You know, we think about, you know, we got that manger and the wise men and the shepherds and you got all that, right? You follow me here? The nativity scene and all that? That's things from our perspective. What's it like from God's perspective? It looks like this. God the Father saying to God the Son, I am sending my messenger before you. You are going to go to them. But before you go, I have to prepare the way for you. I have to send a messenger before you to prepare the way. And where does this messenger have to go? Well, he has to go into the wilderness. Again, when we read that word wilderness, I mean, you and I tend to think, oh, yeah. Again, worldly perspective. John the Baptist, he's living in the desert. He's in the wilderness. He's a wild man. And he is. I mean, he is. He could be on Survivor. He'd do all right. You know what I'm saying? But it's not what's happening here. Think about it from the perspective of heaven. Think about it from God's eye view. What is the wilderness? What are the wide places? What's the inhospitable, uncultivated place? When Adam and Eve sin, they're expelled from the garden. And where do they go? They go east of Eden into the wilderness. You would do well, I would do well, if we understood our life, your daily patterns this week, your, ha- at your patterns, your habits, your attitude, what you do, as wilderness that God has to enter. It's not a hospitable place. It's uncultivated land. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? This is really important. There's a lot of preparation work that has to be done for the gospel to take root in wilderness, in wilderness places. You know, we kind of get this idea from, you know, a lot of our contemporary churches, you know, that really you come to Jesus and, you know, he might tidy things up around the edges a little bit. But generally speaking, he loves you just the way you are and wants you to stay that way. Not true. Not true. Not true. The Lord Jesus Christ comes to hardened hearts, cold hearts, hearts that are quite content and comfortable staying at a distance from him closed off to him and to one another. And I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. <coughs> Preparation work has to be done. If we're to receive Jesus. If you, Christian, are to receive Jesus. I mean, this is what Jesus talks about when he talks about the parable of the sower. Do you guys remember the story? There's a guy and he's sowing seed, a farmer, he's sowing seed. He's sowing it all over the place. I don't know why uh, Jesus in this story is kind of funny. I don't know what the farmer, farmers don't do this, okay? Farmers prepare a place, right? But in the parable, Jesus has God doing something crazy. God's just taking the seed and chucking it everywhere, right? That's what he's doing in the parable. He's throwing it all over the place. The gospel's going all over the world. The spirit of God is being sown all over the world. What matters though is what kind of soil the seed falls on. That makes all the difference in the world, you see. The farmer's sowing the seed, it's going all over the place. But some of the seed is going to fall in wild places. And when it falls in wild places, when it falls on that hardened earth, uncultivated soil, the seed just falls on top of the ground, never penetrates, never goes anywhere, just sits there. And then he says, the birds come and they eat it up and it's gone. That's what happens when the spirit of the Lord Jesus falls on hard hearts. 
You come to church, you listen to a message, and I don't, you want to know a symptom of a hard heart? You're sitting here listening to me and you're just thinking about the fight that you got in with your wife on the way here. Or you're judging the person in front of you. Or you're looking at Wes and you're thinking, dude, get a haircut, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or you're thinking about what you're going to do a few hours from now. Or you're thinking about, is this, is, is this worth my time being at church? That's all, that's all symptoms of a hardened heart. A soft heart is a heart saying, Lord, I want to hear what you have to say to me right now. What do you have to say to me? What do I need to hear? What does my heart desperately need to hear? It's a heart, a, a, a heart that isn't hard is a heart that prays before even entering the building of the church. Lord, prepare me to receive what you have to give to me today. Your words are life for me. Your words are the difference between life and death for me. You, you, sh Lord, teach me your paths. Show me your ways. I want to hear from you. I want to know you. I know that my heart is hard. Humble me, Lord. Open me up to receive from you. That is a heart willing to receive the word of God. And what Jesus says is when, when the seed is thrown out onto that heart, well, it takes root, doesn't it? It begins to grow and it bears fruit. Our hearts have to be prepared to receive Jesus. The Christian heart has to be prepared to receive Jesus. If you leave, and, and, and this is the thing about it, like if we just let our hearts be, they will just by their own natural inclination just grow hard. Do you follow me here? I do a lot, you guys know this, I do a lot of farming and I do a lot of gardening and all this kind of stuff, you know? If you just leave the field, it, it won't get better and it won't stay the same it always just gets worse. You follow me here? It gets hard. The weather, the rain beat down on the soil. It gets hard, right? It gets overgrown with weeds, thorns. This, we know all of this, right? So the Christian heart has to receive preparation, cultivation. It has to be broken open. And this is, what, this is what God's doing by sending this messenger into the wilderness to break open the hardened, hard hearts of the people so that they can receive life. Yeah? That's what we find. We read, John appeared. Behold, <laughs> there he is. John appears baptizing in the wilderness. Where is he baptizing? In the wilderness. <laughs> you follow me here? Proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This isn't Christian baptism John's doing. He's not baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He's not doing what we do up here when we have our baptistry and we... We baptize people and they profess, their, they profess Jesus as our Lord and Savior, receive the Holy Spirit. That's not what John's doing here. John's doing a baptism of repentance. John's saying to the people in the wild places, people with the hardened hearts, he's saying, change your ways. You need to be forgiven. You are far from God. You are distant from Him. It's time to draw near. And you can't draw near without repentance. It's a hard word, man. It's a hard word, but it's true. It's what we need. Do you notice I'm really preaching to this side of the church? That's because you guys are doing great. <laughs> you, know, you guys don't even worry about y'all. Yeah, it's you guys. <laughs> y'all. Mm. Baptism of repentance. 
what is a baptism of repentance? Well, it says here at the end of verse 5, you have to confess your sins. Again, these aren't popular words today. We don't like the word sin. We don't like the word confess. Who wants to confess their sins? We'd much rather confess our strengths, wouldn't we? Yeah, that's what we're taught today. Highlight our strengths. You know, we need to build our self-esteem. We need to feel better about ourselves, right? We need to encourage ourselves. And all. You follow me? No. No, that's not right. Because this is the thing. When you're talking about the ways of the Spirit, man, when you tend to exalt yourself, when you do exalt yourself, I mean, listen to God's word. When you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. But if you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, he will lift you up. I know it's backwards. I know it's paradoxical, but it's true. It's true. You know, the people that I know that really want to like try to highlight their strengths, always profess in their strengths, I don't even think they're convinced. Deep down, they know. It's better, it's better to be truthful about the dark that's inside. To bring that to the Savior and say, heal me of this, forgive me, wash me clean. It's hard work, but it's, man, it's life given. My kids asked me for Christmas presents, like uh, Christmas present ideas. I guess supposedly I'm the, I'm the guy that you can't buy a present for. I don't, but this is what my kids tell me, you know. They just say I'm into weird stuff, and they don't know. Like, you know, it's true. I like, I like old books. I mean, you know, like, um, you just can't find this stuff. You know what I mean? So they asked me, like, like what, what, do you, uh, what do you want for Christmas? And I said, do you know what I really need? I need a hand hoe. I don't know if you guys know what a hand hoe is. You need a hand hoe. Here's a picture of a hand hoe. Those things are awesome. Okay? The hand hoe is like one of the best inventions known to man. Okay? That thing, I mean, I have worn mine down to like this little nub. Okay? Like it's, it doesn't even barely work, right? I've used it so much, this thing has just worn down to almost nothing. I said, I need another hand hoe. You know, a hand hoe is great because one, it's great for weeding, right? You can get all this stuff and you're doing this kind of stuff. But, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's one of the best ways to get the weeds out of the garden, right? But you know what's even better than that and more than that? You use it to prepare the soil to receive the seed. Here, here's, here's like farming 101. Do not take your seed and throw it on the ground. It will die, okay? You have to prepare the soil. So you get out something like this and you just start chopping. Chop, chop, break it open, break it open, break it open. Get that thing exposed to the air and the water. Get that soil ready and receptive, right? You, you follow me here? I want you to hold on to that image because this is what confession is. Confession is getting out your spiritual hand hoe and doing this on your heart and heart. Breaking it up breaking it open so that it can receive the seed so the seed won't fall upon you and just be washed away or be eaten away your heart gets it, it takes it takes some cutting on us like i said last week cutting but it's good it's healthy it's life-giving because it prepares your heart to receive the grace of god otherwise it's just going to wash right over you and you'll be living, you'll be living your life. You'll be talking about me and Jesus, me and Jesus. And meanwhile, your heart is heart and you are far away. You are far from the kingdom of God. Do you want to know how? Begin to do some of that work. Break open the soil of your heart. What does that take? Well, it means this. You and I, this week, I want you to think about this week. I don't want to think about, I want you to 
Go down into the places in you, those dark places, all right? Those places that you don't normally talk about, the things that you keep to yourself. I'm talking about your private thoughts. I'm talking about the things that you said to your wife. I'm talking about the things you said to your husband. I'm talking about the, the, the infidelities that pop up in your mind. I'm talking about the selfishness that pops up in your mind. I'm talking about the judgmental, judgmentalness that wells up with you. I'm talking about all of that because all of us have it. We take it and we, Lord, this is who I am. Forgive me, heal me, liberate me, free me, wash me clean, make me whole. This is not the way of life that you called me to. You called me to more than this, Lord Jesus. Help me in this, Lord Jesus. I depend on you, Lord Jesus. And I want you to see some things happen in that place. It's not a fun place, but it's a wonderful place to be because things happen there. There's no question, there's no, it's not, not coincidental that John the Baptist baptized people in the Jordan River. Do you know why that's important? Because the Jordan River is a boundary. It's a boundary between the wild places and the land of promise. That's what it is. Read your Bible. To go walk into the Jordan, to go into the Jordan is to leave behind the wilderness and enter into the promises of God. And to cross through that river, what we have to do is we have to confess our sins to him so that we can be washed clean, so that we can receive the new life that he wants to give us. And that's as true for you today as it was when you were 10 and you gave your life to Jesus. We've got work to do. You've got work to do. Let's take that heart. Take your heart. Take all the way that you have hardened it and made it this callous, unmoving stone and take it to the Lord and say, heal me of this. Can you go there with me now? Can we do this together now? Wouldn't God, wouldn't God be honored by his people doing this this morning? Saying, Lord Jesus, I know who I am. But heal me, save me, forgive me. Wash me clean. If you're not sure what it is that you need to be washed clean of, you come talk to me. I'll give you some. <laughs> give you some stuff. Yeah. If you don't, seriously, I'll, I'll be serious about this. If you don't, then confess that. Because I'm telling you this, it's the hardened heart that doesn't see. You follow me here? So if you feel like you got nothing, say, Lord, I'm in trouble. I don't even see it. Help me open my eyes. Man, this is a time of hope, God. This is a time of hope. This is a time of restoration. This church is called Restoration for a reason, and this is how it happens, going down into the Jordan. Let's go. Let's go, my people, my peeps. Let's go. Lord Jesus, we stand before you. No, we, we kneel in our heart before you. And we confess, Lord, we confess our sins to you now. We give them all to you now. Go, give it to him. Give it to him. Give it to him. Tell him what it is. Lord Jesus, we confess that we have sinned against you. We confess that we've sinned against you in our thoughts. We confess that we've sinned against you in our deeds, what we have done. We confess we've sinned against you in what we've said. 
and we confess that we've sinned against you and the things we haven't done, the things that we haven't thought, the things that we haven't said that we should have. Lord, we come to you as a people with hardened hearts. We come to you as a people needing your forgiveness. We know your promise. As we break open the hardness of our hearts, we do it now as we confess those things. We know your promise. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and those that are crushed in spirit. So we're not afraid to be crushed before you because we know that you draw close to us in these times. Lord Jesus, put your, put your hand, your healing hand, your forgiving hand, your absolving hand, your forgiving hand upon your people this morning. Begin to warm our cold, hard heart. I pray, Lord, that you melt it. We want to see you. We want to hear from you. We want to walk in your ways. We know we can't do it with a heart that isn't broken open. And so we, we ask you to do it. Break it more, Lord. Break it all open. We receive you, Lord Jesus. We receive your healing work this morning. We receive your healing hand this morning. We trust, Lord, that your forgiveness, which is more than enough, is here right now. Strengthen us, Lord, we pray. That we can receive you again. And all God's people said, You all can stand as we sing this one last song to close out the service.
temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope Yeah.